Well, thank you, choir. Thank you for bringing our hearts and minds around to think of all that took place on that last week of Christ's earthly ministry here leading up to the crucifixion. And certainly there is, there is much to be told and appreciate it being told in song this morning. Uh, this morning I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to John chapter 19. And for a few moments here this morning we'll be stopping to consider one of Jesus' sayings on the cross, one that without a doubt um, is significant, as we would think of all of Jesus' sayings as he's hanging on the cross there to be very significant. John chapter 19, and picking this up here in verse 25, says, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this saying on the cross, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you for the words expressed here in John. Father, how we thank you for the great example that our Savior is to all of us. As we stop to consider his relationship not only with his mother, but also with his disciple John. Lord, as we examine this passage this morning, I pray that we would learn from your word that we would understand certain principles that we can draw from it quite easily that will truly be an encouragement and inspiration to us all. May you bless your word, I pray now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. It's interesting here that as the crucifixion has been going on, and certainly in my mind, um, those videos were very helpful in being able to, to understand the songs. And I sit there and I think to myself the image of Jesus suffering on the cross, the black and white slide that was there, and how, how profound that truly was. We think of the crucifixion. It began about 9 o'clock in the morning. It ends at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. From, from noon until 3 o'clock, there is a great darkness that falls upon the earth, the Bible says. And we would understand that as Jesus is there and he's hanging on the cross, as I mentioned last week, every single time Jesus was going to utter something, he had to literally pull himself up, placing enormous pressure on the nails in his hands and the nails through his feet so that he would be able to get enough air into his lungs so that he could exhale and say what he needed to say while doing so. The ultimate cause of death while hanging on a cross normally was suffocation. And so Jesus is there and his, his lungs and the area around that pericardium is, is filling up with fluid. And as that's happening, it's becoming more and more difficult for him to utter a single word. And yet here we find him in John chapter 19. And while he's hanging on the cross, he looks down at the foot of the cross and he, he notices the women who are there. And John records that these women are there at the foot of the cross, and so is the disciple whom he loved. It's fascinating that only John is the uh, writer who records this event. Now, the reason why is simple. He was the only one that was there. He was the one who Jesus loved. In fact, he's referred to that throughout uh, different places in the book of John. He oftentimes refers to himself that way in a manner of humility. Instead of naming himself, he would refer to the disciple whom Jesus loved. And of course, we know that, that Jesus loved all the disciples, didn't he? And John thought that was very special, and so he, he uses that terminology to bring about uh, an awareness of Christ's love for him. As we look at this passage of Scripture, I think you look at this and you see that there are a couple of, of very important truths that just pop off the page. One is, as we consider the compassion in Christ, is the compassion that he shows to his mother, his earthly mother, Mary. Here we see 
that in Mary's grief, there is a fulfillment of scripture that takes place. If you go back to Luke chapter two in your Bible, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. For in Luke chapter two, after the baby Jesus is born, upon dedicating the baby Jesus, they come there into Jerusalem and they meet a man by the name of Simeon. And it's interesting what occurs. This man was righteous and devout, verse 25 says. So Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. He was looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Isn't that fascinating? In and of itself, it's a fascinating passage. Because here is a man who would not normally have the Holy Spirit of God residing in him. There was not that permanent indwelling until after Acts chapter 2 and the uh, whole event at Pentecost. But here is this man, Simeon, who was holy and devout, and he was praying, looking forward to the Messiah's coming. And God had revealed to him that he would not die until he had actually seen the Lord's anointed. That's pretty exciting. Well, he came in the spirit in the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms, and he blessed God, and he said this. Now, Lord, he says, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. In other words, he says, I'm ready to die. And why was he ready to die? Because he had seen the Lord's anointed, and that was in the person of Jesus. He says, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. Now, he turns to Mary and he says something that is very interesting. He says, behold this child, and there's the baby Jesus. He says, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. In verse 35, he goes on to say this, and it must have struck the heart of Mary, but he says, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Mary was probably thinking to herself, I'd rather if you looked at him and said he's going to be a great baseball player. But she is there and Simeon looks at her. This holy and devout man upon whom the Holy Spirit of God was dwelling and he makes a prediction. And there is a prophecy here by Simeon basically to say that there will be a time that will be incredibly traumatic. It will be, it will be a horrific time And Mary, as you are filled with joy with this little baby, you now are going to be looking forward to something that is truly horrific. I don't think any of us can really appreciate the agony that Mary must have been going through as she looks up at the cross and sees her her oldest son there hanging on the cross, being crucified. All around, people are mocking him. Even the thief on the cross, both thieves were mocking Jesus. They were spitting on him. They were calling him names. They were ridiculing him. You know, as a parent, you get a little ticked off if your kid doesn't get an A plus and you think, you know, hey, he only got an A minus. You know, what's a teacher trying to do? Uh, We become very defensive, don't we? Put yourself in Mary's position. I think it's very, very easy to understand what Simeon had said when he prophesied and said a sword will pierce even your own soul it was not to be a literal soul or sword that would pierce through mary's soul but you understand what he was talking about as you consider the image of jesus hanging on that cross and so here we see in the grief of mary that that truly simeon's prophecy is fulfilled we also see something else as we look at john chapter 19 We see Jesus looking down at his mother and with great compassion, making certain that she is cared for. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, you'll find the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. In verse 12, you'll find this one. Honor your father and mother 
that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. That is reiterated again over in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Here is Jesus, and in the midst of his suffering, he looks down and he sees his mother, and he recognizes the significance of honoring one's father and mother. Now, in certain cultures around the world, family is very elevated, and the process of honoring one's father and mother is observed to a greater extent, perhaps, than even our own culture here. In fact, the Bible talks about in the last days, uh, things are really going to change, and even our relationship with young people and their parents is going to change. But make no mistake about it, this was a familial responsibility that had come down from the lawgiver, God himself, to Moses on two tablets in Exodus chapter 20. And so there you are in that whole process seeing the significance of honoring father and mother. As Jesus does this, he presents to us a tremendous example, does he not? He is truly that godly example, caring for his mother, even at the time of tremendous, tremendous suffering. And so we see his compassion that he extends to Mary, and it is notable. The second thing we see here is uh, the relationship that he has with John the faithful disciple. As we notice here in John chapter 19, again, John is the only one who writes this, but we see in John chapter 19 that when Jesus musters his strength, he looks down and he says, woman, behold your son. Now, I won't get into this too much, but I think my mother's probably glad that I don't call her woman. (laughs) I might try that this afternoon just because I preached on this today. I think I'll call mom this afternoon and say, woman, how are you doing? And I want to see what her reaction is, and I'll share that with you, all right? Uh, We live far enough away, she won't give me a black eye or a spanking or anything, so I'm okay. No doubt Jesus is looking at uh, at his mother Mary, and he's realizing that uh, that she is a woman, and, and it stands out that he doesn't use some other terms. And I think in light of religion today that has created a Mary who is a mother of God, and you have Mariolatry that takes place in certain religions where she is worshipped and elevated beyond a position of biblical honor that the Bible gives to her, it probably is true that in keeping he uses that term uh, to give her the honor she deserves, but not to elevate her into something greater than she is. As he says this to her, He turns then to the disciple whom he loves, who is standing nearby, and he says to John, behold your mother. So behold your son, now behold your mother. And the Bible tells us that at this point on, uh, she is going to go uh, with John and into his household, and he will be the one who is caring for her. Now, I think there's some things that are important to note here. Because John is seen at the foot of the cross, but he wasn't always with Jesus. You see, the Bible talks about the forsaking of Jesus by the disciples. If you would like to, turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 25, and I'll, I'll show you these, uh, or 26, and I'll show you these couple of uh, passages that stand out. It says here in chapter 26, verse 55, that at the time of the arrest of Jesus, when Jesus is being arrested, he turns to the crowds and he asks a fantastic question. And you could probably come up with the answer yourself, but he says, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day, Jesus said, I used to teach sitting in the temple and you did not seize me. You never arrested me when I was in the temple. But all this has taken place, Jesus says, to to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. And that very next sentence, at the end of verse 56, says, then all the disciples left him and fled. When you think of the difficulty and the pain 
that is going through the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. There's probably nothing more difficult than as he takes upon himself the sin of the whole world and God the Father turns his back on him, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, that there is nothing more painful than that. For Jesus to be temporarily rejected by the Father was of enormous suffering for Jesus. But I wonder as well in Jesus' own heart and mind if having his most faithful disciples abandon him, I wonder if that wasn't also a source of tremendous pain. Jesus would say, uh, closer than a, a friend, he would never, he could never be more. He was always a friend to sinners, one who would stick close by. Jesus looked at his relationship with us and he saw the reality of coming to our aid and helping us. There is something that's really painful about being abandoned by people that you consider to be your friends. The Apostle Paul over in Timothy writes about Demas. You know, Demas is mentioned several times in the Pauline epistles at the end. Here he is, Demas is with me, we're serving Jesus, we're doing all these great things. And then in Timothy he says, and Demas, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world more. And you could see as you read that the pain that comes across to the heart of the Apostle Paul. Think about what it was like for Jesus as he is abandoned by all those disciples right after the arrest. Notice uh, this verse here in Matthew 26, verse 31. And Jesus said to them, this is a, a prophecy Jesus is making. He says, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it's written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 31. That word there that you see, fall away, is actually the, the word we get the English word scandalized from. Uh, they felt scandalized. Uh, all of a sudden, on, in the minds of the disciples, uh, it was pretty inconvenient to be following Jesus. Do you know what I mean? It was all good as long as you thought Jesus was going to assume his rightful place as the king of kings and lord of lords. He was going to sit on the throne of Jerusalem, and then it was going to be really good for me. But if he's going to be arrested and something evil is going to happen here, this is very inconvenient. It is troublesome. It is a scandal, and we're going to see you later, Jesus. And so the 11, of course, Judas has already betrayed him. The 11 left Jesus and departed. Gone. They've fallen away. All 11, including John, he's never singled out and said, well, at least John didn't abandon him. Not at all. Jesus' own prophecy, you will, what? All fall away. But here we are in John chapter 19, and John has come back. John's come back. And as John has come back, we would see that the words of Jesus would commission him to take care of something very important. And that was Jesus' own earthly mother. With this, we see the forgiveness of God. We see that God is willing to forgive John. John had fallen away, it's true, but that's not how things would be left. He would have abandoned Jesus, yes, in a time of great need, but in truth, we know that there is really nothing John could have done. But there is Jesus saying, come back. I have responsibility for you. Same thing happens to a lesser or greater degree, depending on how you view it, with Peter. Remember Jesus would say, Peter, you're going to betray me three times. Peter said, oh no, there's no way that's going to happen, Jesus. I love you, I love you, I love you. And what ends up happening? He does exactly what Jesus said was going to be the outcome. He denies him three, and what happens? The, the cock crows, and he, oh, he feels terrible. Is that the end for Peter? 
Not at all. Remember Peter's out in the boat and he's fishing. They've been fishing all night long. They figure they're going to go back to doing what they're going to do. And, and, and Jesus comes and he's there on the, on the shore and, and Jesus says, listen, throw your nets on the other side of that boat because then you'll catch some serious fish. And they got 153 fish in just one sweep of that net. Peter looks and he says, it's Jesus. He dives in the water and he, because he can't walk on water, right? And he dives in the water and he swims to shore and Jesus has the breakfast already made for them. It's right after that that Jesus is going to turn to Peter and say, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. I have things for you to do, and yes, you've failed. Yes, you've denied me. Yes, it was painful for me, but I am a God of forgiveness and a God of restoration. As Jesus looks down, I believe he was comforted to see those women there at the foot of the cross and also his beloved disciple John. Still being faithful, even though he'd left, he had come back. The last thing I want for us to consider is how Jesus' example really is a wonderful example to follow. Look at the example of Jesus' priorities. As Jesus is doing the single most important thing ever done in the world, dying on the cross for our sin, while he's doing that, he is looking down and he is seeing the needs of his mother. You realize that in the priorities of Jesus, it's all about others all the time. Jesus is hanging on that cross not for the Jews of that day, and not for the people who have, have lived before us, but Jesus was not only hanging on the cross for them, he was also hanging on the cross for me. He was hanging on the cross for you. You and I benefit directly from Jesus' atoning work on the cross, and it is now possible for us to place our faith in Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? To be saved from our consequences of our sins. All that because Jesus had his priorities straight. Wow. And then Jesus looks down and he sees a familial responsibility honoring his mother in this situation. No doubt Joseph at this point had already passed away and his mother is left on her own and the oldest son, Jesus, would have been caring for her but he turns and he makes certain that she is cared for by the beloved disciple. See Jesus setting priorities? It's a great example for us, isn't it? It's a great example to know that even entrenched in ministry, we still have family responsibilities. There are certain things that we need to accomplish. There are certain things that need to be done in conjunction with our service to Jesus Christ. Now, our biggest struggle in balancing our priorities is trying to do all the things we want to do because these other things tend to get in the way, don't they? How many of you would golf in the 80s if you won't? Never mind. <laughs> You see, prioritizing things is of great significance. And Jesus gives us a wonderful, wonderful example of setting priorities that are right on the mark. He is blending spiritual responsibilities with the responsibilities of life. Three thoughts for me just to leave you with this morning. Number one, honoring father and mother until the end is very important. It's important for us to do that. Uh, that's not just something that's haphazard. It should be part of our DNA, and so much so even as believers that we would do the right thing and honor father and mother. Second of all, setting those priorities that encompass our spiritual life and our spiritual service are very important too. Blending these two things is, is what God wants us to do. You can't single one out. There are those who have, who have left everything and gone to the mission field, leaving their wives at home, and uh, they've gone on to serve to the detriment of their family. That's not at all what Christ would have done. And then lastly, forgiveness and restoration is a principle that God offers his children. If you're here and you've placed your faith in Christ, there may be times when, when you've let God down in fact, I will predict that if you haven't already had that happen or are not experiencing it right now, you will. Because we, as fallen human beings, even though we've been forgiven of our sin, even though we've been redeemed, still tend to let God down at times, don't we? We do. And God, who is rich in mercy, wants to pick us back up, and he wants so very much to restore us to himself. That is good news, isn't it? One thing I want to leave you with, 
Do you remember the Rocky movies? Do you remember Rocky Balboa? You remember in Rocky chapter, or Rocky the movie, part four, right? Chapter four. He gets knocked out and he gets injured and he decides he's going to retire. In, in Rocky V, he decides, though, that uh, he'd like to be associated with boxing. So he finds this young man by the name of Tommy Gunn. And uh, he decides to train Tommy Gunn. And Tommy Gunn ends up becoming a very accomplished boxer, and he becomes the world heavyweight champion. And there is something about this guy. I mean, he is really the big deal. And, you know, and, and Sylvester Stallone, the, the big Rocky, is, he's loving it, right? But he's getting older. Well, Tommy Gunn, after he wins the championship, starts to go sideways, and the last 15 minutes of the movie uh, is really what it all boils down to. But Tommy Gunn has been living a riotous lifestyle. He's into this, he's into that, and he becomes so big uh, that he thinks he's bigger than the world. And so uh, he figures he doesn't need the old man Rocky around anymore. And uh, he goes to Rocky's home and he threatens Rocky. He threatens his wife and he threatens his son. And Rocky is furious with Tommy Gunn. And Tommy Gunn challenges Rocky to take it outside and we're going to have a huge fight. Well... He, of course, uh, Rocky was up to every challenge, I guess. Uh, he's so angry, he rips his shirt off, and they start rumbling in the neighborhood. People start calling the news organizations, and, and there's cameras everywhere, and this is a huge event. But Tommy Gunn is, is too strong. He's too fast. And uh, Rocky can't keep up with him. As much as he tries to keep up with him, he just can't keep up with him. And at one point, Tommy Gunn reaches back, and he gives Rocky a right that really nails him. And Rocky crumbles into the gutter on the side of the road. And there he is laying there. He's an old man. He's beaten. He's broken. He's bruised. Uh, and he's been defeated and destroyed. And while he's lying in the gutter, he remembers his past. And the movie screen flashes his thoughts. And pictures are shown of Rocky in his younger days when the Italian stallion first went in the ring. His opponent says, you're going down. And Rocky says, oh, no, I'm not. And Rocky fights him to a draw. Well, after that flashback in this Rocky V, he tries to get up out of the gutter, but he can't. He can't do it. His thoughts flash to a scene from Rocky I, and he remembers another fight where he came back to win. He remembers that he has the power to come back. Motiv again, motivated again, he tries to get up out of the gutter, but he can't. And Rocky remembers Mr. T from Rocky III. In this movie, Rocky's been beaten and bruised, broken, defeated, but he again fights back and wins the championship, and he remembers this win. He tries again to get up out of the gutter, and he can't. Rocky has another flashback. He remembers Ivan Glasgow, Rocky IV, the Russian machine who nobody could beat. Rocky remembers how he went to Moscow and he beat the Russian. He remembers how the Russian crowd started chanting, Rocky, 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 as he puts the American flag around him. He remembers his victory, and again he tries to get up out of that gutter, and he can't. But then Rocky remembers one other picture. He sees his old coach, Mickey. He remembers the day when he was in a fight and he'd been knocked to the canvas, and he remembers Mickey sitting over him saying, Get up, get up, you bum, because Mickey loves you. Now, that's when Rocky theme song starts playing in the movie, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Rocky shakes his head, and he pushes himself up from the gutter. Tommy Gunn is walking away, thinking he's won. And Rocky says, yo, Tommy, come on back. We're going to go one more round. He finds power he didn't have. He finds ability he doesn't have because he remembers somebody who had died and had come back to life to let him know he was loved. No matter what our status is, how many times the devil knocks us down? 2,000 years ago, somebody died for us because he loves us. And he wants us to get back up. I, I think of John. It just leaves such a mark on my, on my memory and my mind. When I think of John, who along with the other disciples had abandoned Jesus, but yet there he was at the foot of the cross. And Jesus is giving him responsibility. Peter, the same thing. And you and I are no different. God wants to get us to come up and, and stand once again and give us the strength and the ability and the power to be able to serve him. Our God is a gracious God. Imagine Jesus hanging on the cross and seeking to meet the needs of his family 
and give responsibility to someone who had abandoned him previously, but now has set him back up for the future. Our God truly is a loving God who desires to restore and reset that which is broken. Would you pray with me, please? This morning you may be here and you may be that person who would look at your life and say, I've, I've been down in the gutter. Now maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity. Maybe your life has been lived to its own self and you've been and living for yourself in such a way that really hasn't allowed God to be a part of it. But you recognize that this is a dead end And maybe you're here this morning and you realize that this Savior who's hanging on the cross here in John chapter 19 is the Savior who went to the cross to pay for your sin and mine. Maybe today you'd call upon his name and be saved as the scripture says. God desires for all of us as human beings to come through faith into a relationship with God who is holy And that can only happen through Jesus Christ. Would you call upon the name of the Lord? Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ today and know beyond a shadow of any doubt that you're on your way to heaven? Would you make a decision like that? Maybe you're here today and you say, I'm in the gutter. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. But at times, I disappoint Him. My friends, God wants you to know that he is here to pull us up out of the gutter. He's here to set us on our feet once again. He's here to to bless us with forgiveness and restoration. And if that's what you need, my friends, his arms are wide open. Come and talk with someone this morning. Pray with someone today. Make certain that you see the restoration that God has for you. That you would leave here today knowing that you have a right relationship with God. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for the spirit that we see in Jesus who's hanging on the cross. A spirit of affection for his mother and for John and for the whole world. Father, we're blessed by the love of Christ. The compassionate Christ is truly our great example. Father, I pray that if there's someone here today who's unsure of their eternal destination, that they would make sure before they leave here today. For your word tells us, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so I pray that indeed would happen as people's lives are transformed because of faith in Christ. And I pray as well, Father, today, for those who may be somewhat dejected here this morning, knowing that uh, in their mind, perhaps in your mind, that they have failed, and Father, yet you are there to, to give them a hand up, forgive them of their sins, and truly the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, may we find that cleansing today. May we be out of that gutter and standing up praising our Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. May you continue to work in our hearts and lives today in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of announcements before you leave here today. Our care and concern teams are here at the front. If you have some, something you'd like to pray about, uh, you have questions about something that you've heard, they're here to help you this morning. And so just a word of encouragement there. Also, if you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. And again, don't forget, uh, stop by the welcome desk in the uh, foyer on your way out. If you fill out a visitor's card, you get a nice uh, little gift bag with all kinds of good stuff in it. So check that out if you would. Also want to mention that um, you may have may or may not notice, depending on which side of the church you park on, but over here we put four new handicapped spots. 
Um, there will be little signs under them that say the handicap spot is only on Sunday morning. So if you're coming in for meetings or Bible studies, you can park there. Uh, we have other handicap spots that, that we don't usually fill, but on Sunday mornings we're filling these. So um, just a word there. Also, if, you're, um, if you would be so courteous, um, some of our, our more seasoned members are having a difficult time navigating through the traffic uh, between services and so forth. And uh, they're kind of getting bumped into, and uh, maybe they're a little unsteady, and so uh, that is a concern for them. So let's do the Jesus way, and let's help them, all right, uh, as opposed to running people over like it's the day before Christmas at Walmart. Um, you know, people are, are running for muffins and coffee and elbowing people. And hey, Anybody here ever heard of Filene's Basement in Boston when they sell those wedding dresses? Okay, I've been there. That is nuts, and that is not Christ-like at all. Just saying. All right, so, so let's be kind and, 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 and let's be Christ-like in, in all of those things. We do have some things coming up on uh, Friday this week. We have a service. Isn't that great? This is the first day of the week, and on, on Friday we have another service. And so we're looking forward to that. We'll have uh, communion as part of the service, and you don't want to miss that. Good Friday, one service, 7 p.m. And then next Sunday, we do not have ABFs in between the 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. Instead, we're inviting you to, to stay for some fellowship. Activity room one and two will have set up. There'll be food in there um, that uh, we're going to buy. No, you're going to bring. Um, we'll have some stuff, but we want you to bring, if you wouldn't mind, like a breakfast casserole or a fruit dish or something along those lines um, so we can just have something to stand around. It's not about the food anyway. It's about the fellowship, but you want to be standing there holding something. I don't know why, but um, it's okay. So we're looking forward to that. That's next Sunday. That's Resurrection Sunday. So we're excited about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're really fired up about all these things that are going on. Men's ministry, we will start um, a brand new Series 33, A Man in His Marriage. That starts tomorrow night. There's six weeks of that, and so keep that in your mind. Sign up, if you would, um, out there on the table. That would be helpful. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Don't forget, the Care and Concern teams are here at the front. If you have some questions or or want more information about something. Father, we thank you that you are so gracious and loving towards sinners like us. Father, we rejoice in the plan of salvation, which includes all of us, giving all of us the opportunity to place faith in Christ. We look forward to this week, Lord. We know it, um, it's a big week, and we look forward to, to coming and, and observing the death on the cross, the sacrifice that was made for us. And we look forward to that celebration on Friday. And then we look forward to the resurrection Sunday that follows it. And truly the victory over death that is expressed through the resurrection. So we're thrilled, Lord. And we just pray that you'd walk with us this week. And help us, Father, to honor and glorify you in all things. For it's in Christ, our Savior's precious name. Amen. God bless you.